Service will begin in 15 minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service will begin in 10 minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service will begin in five minutes. Thanks for joining us.
service is about to begin. Hey guys, my name is Steve Reichel. This is my wife, Geneve. We want to welcome you to today's service of the Boston Church of Christ. My wife is going to share something. Thank you. <laughs> I've, I've mentioned this idea to many of you, the idea of not wanting to waste a crisis, right? And so I think about what's going to be my pandemic skill, right? My kids actually, believe it or not, I let them paint their room, the trim, touch-ups, the whole thing. And they did an awesome job, like so much so that we might never hire painters again. Um, we've learned to kayak, we've bought a badminton set, and we've become people who play badminton, like all these interesting things that never would have happened as a result of the pandemic. Um, there have been profound joys, profound times like my daughter and I were skipping through an ocean yesterday, getting bossed or bounced around like, like bean bags. Um, but there have also been times that have been really, really difficult. Like at the end of the day, frequently, I'll just get in my car and the and the tears will start coming down and I don't even know why, because we're living in this absurd and ridiculous time. And so the, this idea came to me, or rather the scripture, and it's Romans eleven thirty three, and it says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And I thought, yep, that's it. We have no idea why we're going through this double pandemic. We have no idea why we're experiencing this, when it's gonna end, how it's gonna end, if, when, a vaccine. So perhaps my pandemic skill is just leaning in and settling in and listening and getting closer to God and my family and being okay with the uncertainty. So, you know, one of the games that my kids and I like to play with each other at the, at the end of the night when we have a smaller, lesser schedule is we ride on each other's backs. And we have a specific way we spell certain letters, like an I is a going down with a dot. And then they know that a, an E is the only letter that when dad swipes down, he goes. <whistles> you may not understand that, but we do. And the reason my kids understand that is because they lean in and we connect and we work on connecting. And, and that's what God is like. That's what this service is, maybe the start for you or continuation for you if you're a longtime Christian. I just wanna encourage you to lean in, to let God speak to you um, for things that aren't clear, mm -hmm. to look for clarity, to listen. And if something isn't spelled quite correctly, ask about it. Um, welcome to today's service. I hope you have a great time and God bless.
Guest preacher today. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Matt Weber, and uh, for the last year or so, my wife and I have served as an evangelist and women's ministry leader in the South Cities region here in the Boston Church of Christ. And uh, honestly, we're blown away 
by what God is doing here in Boston. Even though half of our time here has been spent in quarantine, uh, it's been inspirational to see how God's Spirit has moved throughout the church. You know, a few weeks ago, Richard asked me if I'd be willing to preach to you guys here in the central region. And like any minister, uh, the first question I asked him was, well, Richard, are there any specific needs or themes that you guys are studying right now? And he wanted to leave it somewhat open-ended to me, but he did say that preaching on something in regards to the Holy Spirit would be great. Uh, something about keeping in step with God's Spirit. And uh, let me tell you something. Th this, is, uh, this is God, because had he said this to me about six months ago, I would have pulled one of the, I don't know, I think I'm going to be sick that weekend. <laughs> uh, because honestly, the, the Holy Spirit is a very intimidating and deep topic. But uh, let me tell you what God has done. Given everything that's been going on in the country and in the world with the pandemic, with the racial tension, with even politics in the South Cities region, we decided that we wanted to spend the entire summer studying God's Holy Spirit. And since the beginning of the summer, we've done an eight part sermon series entitled Fired Up. And it's been a sermon series on God's Holy Spirit. And so this whole summer, I've been studying God's Spirit. So when Richard said to me, can you preach on the Holy Spirit? My thought was, absolutely, bro. Can't wait for it. The Holy Spirit, honestly, what I've come to learn is not just the third wheel in the relationship between God and Jesus. It's what holds everything together. It's our connection to God and Jesus. It empowers and directs us. It encourages and convicts us. It's the real deal. The Holy Spirit is, is as important and powerful as God and Jesus himself. You know, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the Spirit of God as the active essence or essential power of the deity, conceived as a creative, animated, or inspiring influence. Ultimately, it's the spiritual, influential presence of God. So I have a sermon today that I pray inspires, encourages, and convicts those of us who might have been around for a while, those of us who might be new to the group, those of you who are watching our church service for maybe the first time, those of you who are doing well spiritually, and those of you who might not be doing well at all spiritually. I pray that this sermon touches every single one of us this morning. You know, the Bible says... In Matthew 27, verse 50, I want to rewind a little bit in talking about the Holy Spirit. Matthew 27, verse 50. This is when Jesus is on the cross, about to die. The Bible says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. You know, some of us may read a verse like this, and it might go right over our head. <laughs> and we might be asking ourselves, what's the significance of this curtain of the temple? And why are curtains even so important to God in the first place? So here's a little history about the temple. So the first temple was constructed in about 1000 BC by King Solomon after his father David had conquered Jerusalem. Well, unfortunately, in 586 BC, that temple that Solomon constructed was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Well, then a second temple was built around 515 BC when the exiled Jews who were then conquered by the Persians were allowed to return to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple and that second temple was constructed in 515 BC. And that's the temple that we're reading about there in Matthew chapter 27. Now here's the thing, when the temple was constructed, God gave very specific instructions on how he wanted the temple to be built. Every detail was mapped out by God and the temple was constructed in that way. And God wanted to be amongst his people. So he put within the temple, the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing, because God's spirit is holy, it, along with the ark, was separated by, guess what? A curtain, the curtain of the temple. 
in that area with, with, with where the, the, the Holy Spirit was, was called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter this area. And only once a year on a special day called the Day of Atonement. And on this day, the priest had to prepare himself by offering specific sacrifices and dressing a certain way. And if the priest didn't follow all of these specific directions, guess what? Unfortunately, he would drop dead in the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Because in order to be in the presence of God's Spirit, you must be holy. See, the high priest, he had to come correct. You know, and if you want to do a little study on this for yourself, you can look in the Bible at Leviticus 16 and Hebrews chapter 9. And you know, there's an old Jewish tradition, legend has it that, uh, and this isn't in the Bible, it's just a tradition that the high priest would actually tie a rope around his waist. Because if he hadn't come correct, if he hadn't done all the appropriate sacrifices and, 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 and wore the proper attire in the presence of God's Holy Spirit, he wouldn't be holy. And if you're not holy in the presence of God, he would drop dead. So he would tie that rope around his waist so that the other priests can kind of drag him out because they weren't permitted to go within the Holy of Holies. Now, I say all this to say that that's what was required to be in the presence of God's Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant. So now fast forward to what we just read. So when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that there was an earthquake and that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, so I've been in a few earthquakes before, but never have curtains just torn in half. It's almost as if God took that curtain and tore it in half himself. Now remember, what was beyond that curtain? What was on the other side of that curtain? It was God's Holy Spirit. That curtain is what separated God's Holy Spirit from everything else. So now if that curtain is torn in half, if it's torn in two, there's no more separation between God's Holy Spirit and man. Now, who has access to God's Holy Spirit? Not just the high priests anymore. Now, anybody has access to God's Holy Spirit. See, Jesus' death on the cross was a big deal. It was almost as if God was doing away with that old covenant and establishing a brand new one. See, now God's Holy Spirit is all around us. It's guiding It's directing us. And now, that Holy Spirit is looking for a new temple. And when you're baptized in the name of Jesus, as the Bible says in Acts 2.38, you receive that Holy Spirit. Hence why in 1 Corinthians 6.19, the Bible says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Your body is a temple. So if you're a baptized follower of Jesus Christ, you are a bearer of the presence of God. You have God's Holy Spirit. You have a part of God in you. God's Holy Spirit, the power, the love, the self-discipline, and all the fruits of the Spirit that the Bible mentions. That's a pretty big deal. It's amazing that God would do something like that. But here's the thing. We use this term, Holy Spirit, so loosely. We've got to make sure not to take the holy out of Holy Spirit. I hope you're following me here. Hebrews 12, verse 14, the Bible says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You know, to be holy means to be set apart. To be holy means to be consecrated to God. You know, holiness is very scriptural and appears about 600 times in various forms or fashion in the Bible. Matter of fact, there's even a book of the Bible, a whole book of the Bible dedicated to holiness, the book of Leviticus. You know, and there's a misconception today that holiness means bund hair, long stockings and long skirts or old, cold stone churches, but Holiness isn't 
a, a physical appearance. Holiness is a way of life. And brothers and sisters, holiness is not an option. You see, if a person claims to have the Holy Spirit, but is not holy, then that conversation or argument is over. God is holy. His Spirit is holy. So we must be holy. The title of the message today is The What Spirit. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Righteous Father, Lord, we uh, come before you humble because you are a holy God. Lord, we are grateful that we can approach your throne with confidence. Lord, I pray that as I preach this morning, this afternoon, actually, as I record, uh, Lord, that you uh, empower me with your spirit, God, that you speak words of wisdom, uh, words that anyone who's viewing this service today needs to hear. And God, that we all leave this church service just a little bit closer to you. In your son Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, I want to go ahead and make a confession right off the bat. I want to confess that this isn't a subject that I know everything about, so you're not hearing from an expert today. Uh, now, I've made a lot of progress in my life, but I still have a long way to go. And I've come to find out that over the course of my years of being a disciple, this is something I've had to update in my life over and over and over again, kind of like an iOS device or an old school Windows as some of us might be more familiar with. But putting the sermon together wasn't easy. And I've preached similar sermons like this and, and every time I prepare myself to preach a sermon on holiness, honestly, I'm convicted by it. So I'm speaking to you as a brother, just brother to brother, a brother to sister here, as a peer. Let's read again in Hebrews 12, verse 14. The Bible says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You know, we're commanded to pursue holiness. And then if we don't, and if we're not holy, then unfortunately we won't even get a glimpse of God. So what does it mean for us to be holy today? Here's a little example, a little illustration. Think about a farmer. A farmer's in partnership with God. Now a farmer, he has work to do. A farmer will plow a field, sow seed, fertilize, cultivate, all the while knowing that this farmer, he is dependent on forces outside of himself. The farmer can't cause seeds to germinate and take root. The farmer can't make rain fall. The farmer can't control the weather. The farmer can't cause the sun to shine. For the farmer to be successful, he's dependent on God. Now, however, that doesn't mean the farmer can just sit back and say God's supposed to do everything. Because unless the farmer diligently fulfills his responsibilities and puts in his work, then he won't have any harvest whatsoever. The farmer is in partnership with God to get a harvest. Farming is a joint effort between God and man. Man can't do what God can do, and God won't do what man ought to do. So what does that have to do with us today? <laughs> Holiness is a joint effort between God and the Christian. No one can attain holiness without God working in their life. Hebrews 10.10 says, And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now praise God for that, that we're made holy through Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, we still have to do our part we're made holy by God, but then we have to maintain that holiness by our own effort. And through your holiness, it enables God's Spirit to produce all the fruits that the Bible promises. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about two things that I believe influence our holiness. Point number one is your intake. Your intake. Now, like a physical body, what you put in is important because it influences how you perform. For instance, what you eat will influence and affect your health, your weight, your sleep, your energy, your confidence, and many other things like that. And obviously, what you put in, it's going to come out. 
spiritually, what you put in is going to come out. Jesus said in Hebrews 7, verses 14 and 15, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now, this is interesting. What Jesus is saying here is that it's not all the stuff around us that makes us unholy. It's what you do with it that makes you unholy. It's how that stuff around us manifests itself. It's how it comes out of us. And I'm a firm believer that what you put in will come out in some form or fashion. Because Jesus also said in Luke 6, 45, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what that means is if you are subjecting yourself to a lot of things that are just unholy, sooner or later, it's going to come out in some way. It's going to influence you. It's going to make you unholy. Here's an example. Take ships, for example. Ships don't sink because of the water around them. A ship sinks because of the water that gets inside of it. Brothers and sisters, obviously it goes without being said that we live in a very unholy world. But we can't let the world influence our faith, our character, in our actions. I'm going to say two things about this. First, obviously there are things that you can't control. Let's just get that out the way. What do I mean by that? I can't control what somebody is wearing around me. However, I can control how I look at them or how long I look at them. I can't control what's said on the news, but I can control how much I watch it. You see where I'm going with this? Politics, race, economy, social things. I can't control those topics. You can't control those things. But you can control how much and what you take in. And you can control how you respond. And how you respond better be holy. But secondly, there are things that you can control. And I'm going to take a little bit more time on this one right now. Let's go back to that example of that ship. You know, a sailor on the ship, a sailor will get burnt out if they're consistently trying to get water out of the ship that has water coming in. And in my head, I get this visual of a, of a sailor with a bucket just tirelessly throwing water out of the boat. And honestly, that sailor should do one of two things. Either fix the leak where all the water's coming in, or, or sail on much calmer water. You know, I'm going to step out on a limb here. And my guess is that there's many of us whose holiness is being affected because of what we voluntarily subject ourselves to. We got leaks in the ship. What am I talking about? Things like your media content, the things you watch, the things you listen to, the people you follow on social media. And I know this is a big one today because many of us are spending a lot more time in front of a screen given we're quarantined or sheltered in place. And Satan's having a field day with this one. You know, trying to be holy while having certain things in our life that are unholy is very exhausting. <laughs> and it's a losing battle. How do I know? I've been there before where I'm subjecting myself to TV shows or movies or music that isn't helping me become a stronger Christian. I think you know what I'm talking about. And because I'm a, a big communicator, what I listen to then starts to affect my speech. And my speech becomes more crude or disrespectful or coarse, unspiritual, because of what I'm voluntarily subjecting myself to you know 
there came a point in my life where I just had to stop watching certain things. And, and even today, even with the convictions I have, I, I've still got to be very mindful of what I allow in because I don't want to become unholy before God. I bear God's Holy Spirit. Well, what about you? Are you subjecting yourself to things or content that's making you unholy before God? You know, I want to urge you to treat God's spirit with more respect. Cut back or cut out things that aren't conducive to your faith or your character. Things that are making you unholy. You know what you could do? Start listening to things that, that help and encourage your holiness. You know, one thing I got into recently was the Bema podcast. It's amazing just helping me understand God's word, B-E-M-A. If you haven't listened to it, search it on the internet. It's phenomenal. It goes to the Bible and helping you understand God's word in a deeper way. Or spend more time in prayer now that maybe you don't have to commute to work and spend that time on the road anymore. But do things that increase and help your holiness, your intake influences your holiness. And secondly, I want to talk about your circle. You know, regardless to who you are, the company that you keep will influence you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33, it says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Now this scripture is pretty self-explanatory. But let's talk about your circle. I got two circles I'm going to talk about as well in this one. One is your social circle, your, your physical circle. These are your, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, uh, family members, whatever it is. Uh, 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 these are the obvious, the obvious circle that you have in your life. And, and oftentimes, unfortunately, this circle is uncomfortable to address if it's unholy. But it's easy to understand why we may need to make some adjustments within the company that we keep within our circle. Because they influence us in a godly or an ungodly way. That's your social circle. But then there's also your non-social circle, your not-so-physical circle. This circle can be political, racial, economic. Now, I just want to go ahead and make a disclaimer. I'm not advocating not voting or, or not being involved in racial matters. As a matter of fact, I, I think the exact opposite of those things. That's a whole other message. But what I'm saying is that these matters should not influence our holiness. Holiness isn't something that we just turn on and off like a light switch because of who we're around or, or affiliated with. Here's an example. Take fruit. If you take a piece of rotten fruit and place it next to a piece of perfectly good fruit, what happens? You all know what I've come to learn that happens? The mold from the rotten fruit spreads to the good fruit, and guess what? Both end up bad. So what happens when you surround yourself with people that don't build you up, with people that don't spur you on, with people who don't hold you to high standards, or people who don't call out ungodliness? Guess what? You end up just like them. You know, Christianity, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't want you to forget this. Christianity, it's not about trying to fit in with the world. Christianity is about trying to fit in with the word. And the big difference there is the letter L. And you want to know something? The world is taking a big L these days. L stands for loss, if you don't know. I want to encourage you, don't be influenced by your circle. Influence your circle. You know, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, but what was his motive? It wasn't to be influenced by them. It was to influence them. His motive was to help them become more holy and more righteous. You know, I really respect and appreciate the people who go out and serve the community 
People who are out sharing their faith. People who don't let the world influence them, but want to influence the world. You know, the world's idea of holiness, where the 2020 Christian might be lowered in trash these days. But the Bible's definition hasn't changed ever. The Bible's idea of holiness is scriptural and can only be defined by the Bible. So in conclusion, so back to the beginning. When that curtain was torn and God established a new covenant, I'm going to read two scriptures. Let's contrast these really quick. Look at it, Exodus 19, verse 3. Old covenant. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you're to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. So God says, if you obey and keep my covenant. Then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the, the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. Now let's fast forward to the new covenant. After the curtain in the temple was torn, Peter writes this in 1 Peter 2. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, in the old covenant, the emphasis is on obedience. But in the new covenant, the emphasis is on God's calling, God's grace. And you know what? I'll be the first to say, praise God for God's grace. But just because the emphasis today is on God's calling and on God's grace doesn't give us an excuse to not be obedient. We ought to have the same attitude towards obedience and do our part. Just like those priests who had to come correct in the presence of God's Spirit, we ought to come correct if we have or desire to have God's Holy Spirit. Obedience to God's word breeds holiness. Colossians 1, I'm going to finish up here. In verse 21, the amplified version of the Bible reads, And although you were at one time estranged and alienated and hostile-minded toward him, participating in evil things, I think that could be all of us. Yet Christ has now reconciled you to God in his physical body through death in order to present you before the Father holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And he will do this if you continue in the faith, well-grounded and steadfast, not shifting away from the confident hope that is a result of the gospel that you have heard. Brothers and sisters, let's take care of this special possession that God has given us because he deserves it. Let's have conviction about our intake and let's be influential within our circles because God's Holy Spirit deserves a holy temple central region i will keep you in my prayers we love you from south cities to god be the glory amen let's pray dear father in heaven almighty creator provider god it's humbling just to be able to speak to you today, God. Um, we are so grateful just to have you in our lives and just to have your word, to have um, you as a light, Father. Um, you have always been with us from the very beginning. Um, you knew that we would be born during this time. You know the times and places for everything, Father. And we are uh, so grateful for just the plans that you continue to have for us. 
God, you have been there for us since the very beginning, since in our mother's womb. You knew that we would live about this life and um, get to glorify you, God. Um, and we are so grateful for your son and his ultimate sacrifice for how we should live. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed by our inequities. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. And we are eternally grateful for your son's ultimate sacrifice. We are so grateful for your grace your love. Father, you are steadfast. You are always there with us. God, we will never be able to fully grasp your love and your grace, but we, I just pray that we continue to glorify you with our lives, Father. I pray that you be with the, the sick during this time, Father, that you watch over them and that you heal them. God, I pray for those that are affected by everything that's going on, Father. I, um, I imagine that this has been difficult for a lot of people, God, more than I will be able to understand. But God, I just pray that we continue to live in love and continue to be there for those that need you most during this time. God, it's, it's amazing just to see you work during this time, during a time of unknowns, during a time of fear. God, I pray that we continue to put our fear in you and our security in you. God, you are the ultimate security, the ultimate confidence. I pray that we continue to rely on you for all things. And we are, again, we are eternally grateful for your son and his ultimate sacrifice. We love you and you're in my prayer. As I went down in the river to pray, study in the path that good away, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down. Down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good away, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Come on, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good away, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down. Let's go down, come on down, oh fathers, let's go 
down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down. Come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down. Let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. Down in the river to 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 pray.